be, dude, you'd love the show. It's great. It actually I've is. I've heard it's, it's so really fun. good. Yeah. I, ho- I hope they did a good adaptation. We're talking about The Last of Us right now, guys. They um, talked about how important it was for them to do the best they could with nailing the video game because they're like, we didn't want video game people come. So hopefully they're doing a good job. I, I've i only seen my daughter play the game before. I haven't, I, I don't really know the game that well, but. The how old was Quinn when she played the game? scary. Yeah, how old was she when she played the game? Because that game is scary. <laughs> like there's a yeah. lot of blood. She always loves scary shit. I don't know what her deal is. She's 15, but. She started playing it maybe like like about a year ago or so. Okay, okay. That shit would have scared me as a teenager. Well, I, I just like to do it. I just like sit on the edge of her bed and watch it because I'm like, this is crazy. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> She'd like have like a flashlight and then she'd like see all these crazy zombie people. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting that Quinn is playing that because in that game, like, there are certain ways where you can like cut people's throats mm. and and mm-hmm. fucking like. Mm-hmm. Put people on fire. Be some sort of parental guidance is what you're <laughs> suggesting. I'm just, I'm not trying to throw Quinn under the bus here, but that is quite a violent video game. Mm. But it's a, it's, it I'll is a masterpiece. My, I'll keep my eyes on her. Yeah, you never know. I'll she might, show. she might get a little overly aggressive during a game of volleyball. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's one thing I have noticed, though. I'm like, when it comes to horror stuff, horror games, um, I'm a coward. Uh, there are certain games that I purchased and i've played like resident evil 2 the remake i know i don't think you know it but um i played maybe an hour and i was like i'm done like, those I games do <laughs> you know uh they started getting like too realistic and i would get scared of them and i'm like i can't i don't want to play this game i don't mm-hmm. want to watch it i don't want to see it at night i was like it's too much for me so there's the, too intense yeah cause, so like resident evil would have both like creepy but then the jump scaring just fuck it. I don't, I don't even want to play like no thanks yeah. but then resident evil in vr mm. sucks it sucks so bad oh. just like your hair starts to raise like it just it's not i don't know it's not fun some people really like it though mm. mm-hmm. i don't know why yeah that's the thing like for example sam sam and i watch horror movies all the time mm-hmm. and she's just cool but like for me it's like oh you you want to stop watching the movie now and and go to bed okay i'm coming to bed too because i don't want to be alone now you know (laughs) it's like (laughs) i can picture sam messing with you and like coming to bed with like a mask on i pray to god she doesn't start doing any of that type of stuff because i do enjoy scaring her but Mm. if she started scaring me i wouldn't be able to handle it because i've noticed she thinks it's funny (laughs) to mess with you Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah she loves it she does love it I uh, made a pretty good discovery today. I found some hills in Davis, and it's oh, usually no like super flat. So mm-hmm. um, I found uh, some overpasses that are like uh, pretty legit in terms of like the elevation on them, and they they go on for a little bit. So mm. to like try to like run run them <laughs> takes quite a bit out of you. But uh, I'm happy to have found them because they're supposedly hills uh, when you do the Boston Marathon, and I need some so. Uh, it'll help my training a lot to have some uh, have some a little incline going on. Mm-hmm. How did you like? How did the hills do? Especially since you were using some of those super shoes. How were you doing on those hills today? Yeah, it's doing good. You know, uh, I've been talking a lot about some of David Weck's methods, the, the head over foot stuff, and you know, anyone that's given it a try, you'll find it to be more profound if you go upstairs. If you're going up a flight of stairs, you'll find that you really go head over foot a lot. And I've been just observing just, uh, I don't know, my own movement in general Mm -hmm. and observing leverages that you get and certain things that you do. I'm sure it'd be really fascinating in jujitsu to try to figure out like where you put your head in relation to like where your leg goes and where your arm goes and where your shoulder goes and all those things. But even just stirring up some peanut butter (laughs) earlier today, (laughs) yeah, getting the hips in there. Uh, When I was stirring up some peanut butter today, I was was putting like some protein powder in there. And, you know, you got to use kind of a lot of, you got to, your grip starts to like wear out after a while. But I noticed my body was tilted way to the side. I was like way (laughs) off to the side, you know, tilting. And I'm like, God damn, David Weck. Like that that David Weck's right about a lot of stuff. Anyway, uh, messing with these hills, I found it to be pretty beneficial to really try to push yourself to one side, back and forth, left and right, left and right. And um, I did like 15, uh, 15 hill surges, I would call them. They're not really sprints because like I would consider a sprint like more all out. These are probably, because I'm doing so many of them and each one's a minute long. Oh, yeah. There's, you know, it doesn't make any sense to try to just completely kill yourself with them. So um, I would say my 
average uh, time when I'm looking at my uh, split time, it was a little under 10 minutes. So a, a, a 10 minute, nine minute, 10 minute pace for me on flat surface is me moving pretty good. And so I just thought to myself, that would be a good pace to try to keep uh, going up these hills uh, for a minute on. And then I'm allowed to really rest as long as I want in between, but I am supposed to get in 15 of them in one hour. What percentage do you think you're going? Because after you mentioned those to me, I started doing those surges. And I feel as if like when I do those faster runs on a longer run, that I end up being around maybe... 85 percent mm -hmm. like maybe between 80 to 85 percent and if i'm really booking towards the end maybe like yeah maybe 80 to 85 percent yeah. how do you feel with that well i think that you can get there because of the duration you know the duration is uh it's a lot a minute of anything you know try a minute of squatting or a minute of bench pressing like you'll mm -hmm. find out fast that a minute seems like forever and so a minute of running at a pretty good speed if you're not a runner you're not a track athlete uh, it's quite expensive. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot on your body. And so for me, I would say I'm probably in a similar spot, probably in an 85% range, which I think, um, typically for me, I would say that that would be kind of dangerous, but I've been training and I, and I've, I've gotten used to it, but I, again, I think because of, of how long it takes. So somebody that's looking to, somebody that wants to start to sprint, <clears throat> I, I think that these surges would be a great place to start. Um, I would say, you know, uh, see if you can kind of pretend you're shifting gears and you can start in like gear two or three with your jog. And then you could start to kind of shift a little bit more and, and go a little faster and maybe try to hold a speed for like 30 seconds, 40 seconds, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, the cool thing that I've noticed after treating treating these intervals or these surges in the way of only going between like 75 to 85% is after the run, my body doesn't feel feel beat up. And there's a lot of factors to that. There's all the myofascial release, that habit that we've been mm -hmm. implementing. That's kept my body continuously feeling good every single day. There's these the hot tubbing, all these little things make a difference. But also like, I don't feel anything. Like, I feel like I could do that workout again later on today. And that's something where you can get in these intervals, you can get in those those sprints, um, you can get in a run, and then if you recover well, you can do it consistently rather than getting wrecked. It's like taking mushrooms, man. On your first trip, like, make it nice and easy. Yeah. <laughs> make it so you don't, like, when someone's like, oh, man, I, I took those shrooms that you, that you said and uh, I didn't feel anything. I like that for people. I think that's a great place to start. Rather than them getting just annihilated and being like, man, I was so terrified. I don't know what was going on. I sat on a curb and I just cried for four <laughs> hours. It's like, that does not sound like a good place to start. Yeah. So whether we're talking about fitness or we're talking about getting down with some mushrooms, um, you know, I'll always start out easy because then it's, it's easier to, it's easier just to notch it up a bit. Like it's not hard for you to go out and make it more intense. You know, I've I, you've brought up the the Nike Super Shoes that you use, and obviously you gifted me those ultras. I actually bought another pair of those same ultras, um, but I I don't I've never heard you really explain you know how people if they want to grab a pair of those shoes how they should go about using them. Matt Choi talked a little bit about it and made a lot of sense. He uses those types of shoes on runs. Then he uses Vivos or yeah. any type of barefoot shoe outside in the gym doing anything else. If someone wants to invest in a pair of those shoes, because they're quite expensive, mm -hmm. what do they need to think about before trying to make that purchase? And why should would they even consider that? You know, I think uh, the runners, you know, kind of like lift, like the same thing happens in lifting and the same thing happens with jujitsu. Like everyone's got like an opinion on how you should start and what you should do and all these different things. And really, you just need to figure out a way to get started and you need to figure out a way to keep it safe for yourself. Um, I, I believe that super shoes in general, a super shoe is a shoe that has a carbon fiber foot plate. It's a very difficult shoe to bend. And when you go to bend it, it wants to snap. Um, I also believe that Nike makes the best ones. I could be wrong. There's some people that talk about Adidas and some of these other companies making some good ones. Those ultra ones were good. Yeah, I don't the, know what they're called. What yeah, the ultra ones are nice. It's a little bit wider in terms of the... Uh, in terms of the shoe itself, but the Nikes are like reasonable in terms of their width. I mean, Nike's always going after like the look. So you, <laughs> you, you end up dealing with uh, them being obsessed with the aesthetics of the shoe and not just the functionality of the shoe. But a super shoe has a good, strong cushion and it also has um, 
It also has a carbon foot plate in it. And the shoe itself helps to like launch you forward. So when I just started messing with this experiment of me running, um, the first person I hit up was Ryan Hall. Ryan Hall has all time world record in the United States for a half marathon and a full marathon. And so luckily for me, I got access to some pretty great people. And he was like, get the Nike alpha fly. Like he just, no questions asked, nothing. He just right away said that. Brad Kern, who's been a, a good friend of ours, wrote some books with Mark Sisson. Mark Sisson, really high level um, triathlete for years. Mm -hmm. Brad himself has been into uh, endurance sports for many, many years. And um, Brad had mentioned how he's talked to a bunch of different people and like the super shoe is a huge advancement in running and allows you to do a lot more, allows you to handle uh, more volume. Kind of so like a slingshot. Kind of like a slingshot. <laughs> you get more reps, you get more sets, you get more overall work. More overall work with less damage is a really awesome thing. And as Nsim was pointing out, um, he was able to get through some of these runs more recently uh, without without feeling beat up. And whether you're talking about doing that with a shoe or without a shoe, that is what you're trying to get from your training. Your training is only as good as your recovery. So I think that this is a great place for a lot of people to start. Obviously you have to fit within uh, your financial means and maybe it doesn't make sense for you to start out with $300 shoe. Um, but uh, again, it's going to help to mitigate a lot of stress. And if you watch there's so many videos online of, of people running and showing form and technique over and over and over again. That would be great to learn that, but you're not going to learn that very quickly anyway. And I don't think that you should have a disregard for form and technique because I think it's really crucial and it's important. There's a lot of different things to examine though, and it's going to take you months and it's going to take you years to learn how to run. And since you I'm just going to assume that you don't know how to run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say get yourself a pair of those shoes would be a great place to start. Pat Project family, how's it going? Now, a lot of you guys are lifters, athletes. You're serious about the gym, and we are too. And that's why we've been using Slingshot products for years, all right? You have the original Slingshot, obviously the glittery pink hip circle, which is my <laughs> personal favorite. But if you don't like that, then you have the normal hip circle that's used to warm up the hips. But on the website, they have tons of equipment, knee sleeves, elbow sleeves, the gangster wraps right there. So you need to go check them out. And Andrew, can you tell them more about it? Yes, that's over at markbellslingshot.com. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off your entire order. Uh, links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Question, what size were the ones that you had me try on today? Those were 13. 13. All right, cool. Now, I, I do have another question because... You know, th this is interesting. You've, you've gotten a lot of uh, people messaging you on Instagram, and you've mentioned this before, how like they see you running in those shoes and like, I thought you were all about barefoot. I thought mm -hmm. you were doing this. So, you know, I've noticed even when I do longer runs with like, I've ran in my Shamas, I've ran in uh, the Vivo, the Primus Knits, and I've ran in their trail shoes. Because it's on concrete, there is a level of your feet getting a little bit beat up. Mm -hmm. But I have noticed that my gait, like my, the way I run and the way I strike the ground when I use Vivos, when I use Shamas, when I use Vibrams, has to be ideal. If I don't strike the ground in the right way, I will feel that. And that's actually, it's a good trainer for teaching me how I can best, mm -hmm. like the, the most optimal way for yeah, me to hit the ground. How's your foot supposed to land and stuff like that? Yeah, you learn a lot from it. Exactly, without, um, yeah, land without causing any type of pain, right? But I wonder if one were to just hop on and, and get the super mm -hmm. shoes, the first time I'd used the super shoes on a run with you months ago, when I started to get tired, I started to like heel strike quite a bit. And I was noticing, oh, I'm not feeling that, but that's not good. Mm -hmm. I like, I don't want to strike the ground that way, but the shoes let me get away with it. So I almost wonder if you start off with those types of shoes and the way you're running isn't good and the way you strike the ground isn't good, you could develop bad habits in the way you run. Yeah, because you could just be kind of throwing these kicks to the ground that are <laughs> haphazard or with your yeah. toes pointed out and and all these things. And it could it could be potentially helping you um, to just maybe maybe almost encouraging like shitty form in some way. Yeah, um, I I would I, I would agree with that to some extent. I would also just say like just work on your form. Like what no matter mm -hmm. what shoe you're wearing, like just you know commit to finding someone that you trust that you believe in, um, whether it's Nick Bear or whoever it is that you look up online, uh, uh, Zach Bitter, any of these people, 
you know, listen to some of the stuff they talk about. People, your people are going to talk about cadence. People are going to talk about picking your knees up. Uh, people are going to talk about the way that your foot lands. People are going to talk about all kinds of stuff. The interesting thing when you get into talking to runners, runners actually don't care. It's kind of weird. You would think that runners would care the most, but they don't fucking care. It's almost like if you were talking to some high level soccer players, they're not really going to talk about like the training. They're going to talk about like soccer and how to be better at soccer. Mm -hmm. They're, yeah, they like to lift. They like to talk about running and sprinting and changing angles and stuff. And I'm sure the good ones are really dedicated and got it dialed in, but like, how do you how do you handle the ball that way? How do you always dribble with your left foot like that and cross over to your right? Yeah, they wouldn't be like, "Hey, man, like, tell me more about like your bench press routine." You know, mm-hmm. they 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 want to be like probably pretty specific. Um, I have a clip from uh, Brad Kern that I'll send over to Andrew here of some of the best runners in the world, and they're just going like it doesn't look like anyone gives a fuck, <laughs> you know, and it's not. It would be a mistake to say that anyone has bad form because these are these are the highest level people. And so uh, I, and I don't think the rest of the world has any clue, um, you know, how they should run. You know, it's mm-hmm. just because how, how you run is just like, it's all made up stuff of, of what we think is best. And so we're going to say, oh, if you land with your foot uh, pointed outward or if you had too much pronation, <laughs> you're, you know, you're going to be really jacked up. Who are you channeling? <laughs> Who are you channeling? <laughs> There's so many different versions of running. You know, again, if we're talking about soccer, uh-huh. well, shit, if you're talking about soccer, it'd probably be a good idea to be on the balls of your feet kind of like like most of the time. I, I would say occasionally maybe you go to cut and you get your whole foot in the ground. Same thing with pro football. But like, what if you're just a, like a marathon runner? You don't have to run any, you just run fucking straight. You're not like really doing anything. You're not like juking and jiving and like, you're not throwing spin moves and you're not, (laughs) you're not bringing the knees up. You know, you're not like doing all these different maneuvers. You're just going, right? That's so funny too. (laughs) Juking and jiving. Juking and jiving. These are the weirdest shoes I've seen on Nike's website for a while. Oh yeah. Have you guys ever seen this? The fuck are these? I've seen those, yeah, where you can just slide them on. They, they, they uh, I have a pair that's a little similar to them. It has a spring like in the back of the heel, and you just slide that your foot so right in weird. There. I feel like I'd be disgusted by your shoe closet. I feel like you probably have so many shoes. Oh, yeah. do you? I got a lot of shoes. I got a lot yeah. of kicks. <laughs> anyway, it's interesting that you mentioned soccer though and sprinting <laughs> because, like, uh, I've seen a video years ago where Cristiano Ronaldo was. Uh, racing some fast athlete from another sport. And the one thing you notice is like the when soccer players, really good fast soccer players accelerate, the way they run is very different from the way a football player accelerates mm. or definitely the way a track star accelerates when they're when they're sprinting. The form is very different, but they're all very fast, but it all kind of coincides with the nature of the sport. I remember when uh, MMA was getting to be popular mm-hmm. and there were so many boxing people who were like, these guys don't know how to throw a punch. And it's like, well, this guy has a lot more to worry about now because if, if he throws a punch the way that you're talking about, he could get his ass taken down mm-hmm. or he can get kicked in the head exactly. or get kneed in the face. Like there's a <laughs> lot more things going on. So the way that someone would punch in MMA, especially like a Chuck Liddell, remember Chuck Liddell would really wind up with those. Mm-hmm. Those are not punches that usually are going to do anything in a boxing match. So people were right. Like that doesn't work great in boxing. Um, but you you couldn't, the reason why Chuck Liddell was able to do those uh, like Superman crazy punches was because you couldn't take him down. He's one of the best, one of the most proficient wrestlers of all time in Octagon and Bones Jones. Um, he, Bones is known for his striking, but Bones is like the greatest wrestler but quite possibly the greatest wrestler that the UFC has ever seen, which is crazy because he basically wrestled, uh, wrestled at like a junior college or something. Yeah. Just fucking destroys people. Yeah. But he's known for being a striker because no, like people can't take him down. They can't do anything to him on the ground. And so he's got some good proficiency with the way he throws his kicks and punches. But again, to like pick apart his technique you know, his form on like how he throws a kick precisely. It's like, ask any of the guys that he's fought, you know, mm. hey, what, you know, they're <laughs> they'll be like, he hits really, really <laughs> insanely hard. I don't know what he did, but it hurt. Yeah, they're not going to uh, break down where his foot placement was because <laughs> they were already knocked out. Yeah, got, they got <laughs> fucked up. All right, I got this clip, uh, this one. 
right here. Yeah, so this is uh Maybe you can say his name for us better. Uh, this is the, the goat of... Uh, Elliot Kipchoge? There we go. I probably said it the way every other American says it. <laughs> I don't know how it's spelled. Yeah. Uh, so this is just a group of beastly runners, some of the best in the world. Is it? Is it? Did I send you a... Yeah, there we go. Send me a couple of them, but yeah, here we go. Oh, that's good. Yeah, hey, you can turn it. There's no, there's no need for audio, so... But yeah, they're just... I mean, they're just going. And people that are in the running community would be like, oh, that's so-and-so. And that's, I don't know all the names of mm -hmm. all these people. Forgive me. But um, Kipchoge, his, his foot points out quite a bit, mm -hmm. especially that right foot. And his foot kind of explodes as it lands. Um, like when you watch him and he's going really fast. Uh, and if you slow it down and you check some of it out, you'll be like, yeah, man, whoa, what's going on with his foot? Um, but again, you know, these people are highly analyzed. Um, we're analyzing a guy that runs a marathon in under two hours. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I don't know what more we want to get from him. Anyway, I think one of the things with running, though, you can see he's making these almost like little circular motions with his arms. Yeah. And um, I don't know how many people are going to try to coach you and say, hey, you should run with these like circles in your arms. But he's ending up with these circles in his arms due to the amount of force that he's producing. And so same thing when you go to watch um, Hussein Bull or any of these guys, it's hard to it's hard to figure out what you're watching because you're watching great the, you're watching the greatest of all time. and they produce so much force in what they do that it's hard to get an idea of what it would look like if you're doing it because you're not going to nearly produce the amount of force. so, to say, oh, next time I run, I'm going to kick my foot back the way that I see the, the great Olympic sprinters do. That might not be a bad idea, but it could be an awful idea because you're probably running way slower than the way that they're running. The force production, the amount of energy that they're kicking into the ground and the, the strength of their hamstrings and glutes and the proficiency of how long they've been doing all this stuff for, um, they're black belts you know, of, of what it is that they're doing. And so while it's not a bad idea to kind of mimic some of what you see these people do, um, you could also get yourself <laughs> kind of jacked up from doing it. Mm -hmm. That's why also like it was really cool seeing Matt Choi come onto the podcast and talking to him because yourself, himself, he, you guys both focus and, and have a focus on strength training when it does come to running. Mm -hmm. And one thing you notice with a lot of runners, people who have focused on running as their sport for a long time they haven't had lifting. Lifting wasn't something that drew back in terms of their movement, their movement ability. Mm. One thing you notice is that people that come from the strength background or the lifting background then go into running, when they try to open up their stride, when they try to, um, I guess, open up their body, it's very limited, mm. right? So it's something where if you're coming from this background, it's still a good idea to use strength training, but it's going to be a better idea for you to increase the range of motion of everything you're able to do. Because what I've noticed, and I think you've probably noticed this too, is when you take that to start running, you're now able to open up your body more. Mm. And your ability to create force is a lot better too. Um, so it's just, that's something to think about when trying to emulate a runner if you come from a strength background. You're not going to be as open as they are since it's been something that they've been doing for a very long time. But you can build that. Mm. I think when it comes to uh, lifting, you know, you think about your progression over the years with lifting, um, you start to gain a certain amount of strength and you're like, I should maybe get some wrist wraps or some lifting straps. Maybe I should get a lifting belt. Like I deadlift 315 now and I want to start getting into like an actual strength regimen. I want to start to do five by five or three sets of three and, and I want to handle more weight. So because I want to handle more weight, it would be great for me to utilize this tool that will allow me to lift more weight with better form and better skill and better precision. Now, that doesn't mean that every single rep that you do and every set that you do is now forever with a belt on. Mm. And it doesn't mean that every set that you do is now done with wrist wraps on. Or you might see some of the great bodybuilders of all time uh, actually wrapping their knees for sets on hack squats, leg press. I mean... The fact that I still have to explain to people why they need a slingshot and why they need powerlifting gear, it blows my mind because the best built people in the world, the people that 
you're looking up to the people that you want to emulate. It doesn't matter if it's the rock or if it's fucking Superman or whoever it is, they all wear knee sleeves. They all wear knee wraps. They all wear wrist wraps. They don't wear them all the time, but they wear them often. Mm. And they wear them for certain training blocks and for certain periods of time. So to kind of equate that to running, I think it'd be a good idea that you get a shoe that's going to assist you in your running, that's going to have good cushion on it. It could be a super shoe. Maybe you don't agree with the super shoe. Maybe you think it does a little too much for you, which I would disagree with. I think it, it's amazing that it does that because it mitigates so much stress. And there's so many people that get really jacked up and they get hurt from running all the time. Most of the injuries are kind of like from the knee down. So having a good shoe can really be helpful. But I would also say you don't want to just go out and only run in those you want to run in something else so you can actually build your foot up as well. Yeah. Now, if you feel like you're like, oh, I don't know, you know, spend 200 bucks on this one and 200 bucks on, and you feel like you're starting to spend kind of a lot of money, um, that's totally understandable. And I would say, I would, I would say you're going to be best off over time with multiple pairs of shoes. Um, but you can also just work on training your foot in the gym, you know, here at super training, um, I don't know if your gym is going to allow you to like be barefoot, but we do a lot of training uh, barefoot. And if you can't train in your gym barefoot, then wear a pair of Vivo barefoots in, in your training. So you can actually train the foot the way the foot needs to be trained. You can actually let the toes spread out and splay. And then when you're home, get out of your shoes, throw the toe spreaders on, do these little extra things to, to get your foot to decompress and your foot to relax talked about it a lot but if you have the ability at your gym hit the sled hit the sled using mm -hmm. either bare feet shamas some vivos whatever you can manage that that allows your toes to spread go back and forth pushing a sled pulling a sled but let your feet really dig and get stronger and if any of you guys haven't been i mean a lot of you have been dealing with this or focusing on this since we've been talking about it for so long but if you're new to this give your foot the time it needs to increase in terms of strength and density because our feet have changed a lot within the past year, year and a half, and they're continuing to improve. They're continuing to get stronger. But now, like when I put those super shoes on and I go take a run, it's like, <laughs> it's really cool how just the body can now handle all of that force and everything is relatively pain-free. That was the thing I was going to mention about all those runners. They're running in a certain way and they're able to increase their gait and, and, and the length of their feet, but they're most of them are probably dealing with not as much pain as someone from a strength background or who's bigger would. Mm. Because when we hit the ground, we have so much force that's going to be going through our body. And if we don't know how to naturally handle that when running, it's going to be a, it's going to feel painful as it felt for me when I started running again. That's why I kind of stopped running and stopped doing much because when I would run, I would feel pain in my knees. Mm. If you were to think about like, um, the things that you don't do, the things that you don't want to do, there's there's probably good reason for them. You're probably protecting yourself from doing these things. Um, I'm going to protect myself from like reading really tough literature because I'm not good at it. It doesn't make me feel great about myself. Maybe you protect yourself from running because you're like, that hurts my feet. That hurts my knees. That hurts my ankle. Yeah. Um, you, maybe you protect yourself with trying a diet because it doesn't make you feel good about yourself because you tried it many times and you failed a bunch of times and you're like, I'm a failure at that. I fucking suck at that. So I'm just going to pretend that it's not a huge issue and I'm just going to keep living my life the way that, the way that I am. But you, you want to try to figure out uh, ways over time to become uh, more proficient. And I don't, they, there's so many drills and so much stuff when you get into running, you're like, oh my God. These people do all these drills and stuff. And what I believe, and I don't really know much yet about running because I'm still very new to it. <clears throat> I would think that, uh, you know, if I get myself to a point where I start running some proficient times and someone could say, yeah, okay, he, you know, he earned it and he, he does have a pretty good voice in this. I would say at the moment, I'm still suspect and I'm fine <laughs> with that. I'm, I'm fine with like you uh, not giving me, not giving me credit. Um, cause I, I got to prove myself, right? Like you have to prove yourself. It doesn't matter what your background is. I do know a lot about human movement. I do know a lot about strength training, but this is new for me. So I'll have to, 
I'll have to put up some numbers that, that show that shows something that shows some sort of level of improvement. Maybe I don't run uh, like Nick Bear, and maybe I don't run you know six minute miles for thirty miles or some something wild. Uh, like Zach Bitter did six and a half minute miles for a hundred miles. Maybe I never reached that level of proficiency, uh, but maybe I take myself from being a slouch that could barely run a mile at all. And maybe I get myself to where I can run some fairly comfortable eight minute miles. And you're like, hmm, okay, that's, that's something. There's a lot of improvement there. Maybe if I listen to some of what he said, maybe I can make uh, similar improvements I think that a lot of the drills that you see people do, I personally think that they're a waste of time. <laughs> I don't think that you really need them. I think you would be better off spending your time on your feet, walking and jogging, walking and jogging and working on that for a period of time and playing with it a lot, playing with how does it feel? Why, why does my foot point out when I land this way? Does it really matter? Does Should my foot be straight? And when I listen to somebody about my foot being straight, or if I listen to somebody about how my gait should be opened up a lot, does it hurt? Does it feel better? Does it feel worse? A lot of times you're going to get yourself hurt trying to do something, like really trying to force your body into doing something the body's not used to. Especially you'll find the longer that you've been lifting and the longer you've been doing stuff for, Almost every single time you really listen to somebody else, you really fuck yourself up. And you're like, I know better than this. Why did I do that? I, mm. I, I listened to him too much. I put too much of faith in what the guy said. And now my fucking ankle hurts. And you're so mad at yourself. You're like, I fell for it again, damn it. Because you, you know better than to like put everything, like uh, just invest everything into something that someone said. So be cautious with what you hear. Try to blend it together what what you currently believe or know and be cautious with it and take your time to try to learn it. I don't know anything about any of the drills that you just talked about. Like what is a running drill that you feel is kind of unnecessary? There's a lot of them. <laughs> There's a lot of them. <laughs> and I'm sure that if someone showed me and I learned it and I did it for a few weeks, I'd go, oh, that's, mm. oh shit, okay, that's where that goes. Because you guys know that drills, drillers are killers, right? Mm -hmm. You guys know that certain drills you do, yeah, they're kind of annoying sometimes, but then you're like, mm, that's where I kind of just, I just use that, god damn it, that drill does kind of work. <laughs> 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 I want to be lazy and not do them. There's a bunch of drills. There's like A skips, people running with high knees, people doing butt kicks and mm. uh all the stuff that you did, you know, playing football or soccer, yeah, the different yeah. drills. We have to just remember that when we're talking about people going on a, people are mainly going on a jog and they're just kind of jogging straight. There's not a lot to learn there and there's not a lot to master. So I think that you can be lazy <laughs> <laughs> and I believe you can skip out on some of those things. Um, I would also say it's a little bit like powerlifting where the only reason why the barbell exercises are worth anything is because they're not barbell exercises. But I also believe that you could go home as well <laughs> <laughs> because going home is, is not a barbell exercise either. Oh, do you mean the accessory exercises are mm -hmm. worth anything? Is okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, they're not completely worthless. There's obviously ton, there's obviously <laughs> some benefit to some of it, but you Mark can, says don't drill it. Don't do your accessories. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, you can do your accessory work with the barbell, right? You can do your bent over rows. You can do variations of a deadlift. Um, you could do variations of a squat. Yeah. Most of, m most of your strength, most of your strength's going to, most of your strength for something like powerlifting is going to come from the bar, from a barbell of some sort. Maybe you use some dumbbells here and there, but I, yeah, I've always kind of felt that the majority of the benefit that you get from barbell exercises is the fact that they're barbell exercises and because it's a barbell exercise it allows you to handle a lot of weight mm -hmm. you know you can bench press 315 um but then bench pressing 150 pound dumbbells in each hand would be really really challenging not that striving to bench press 150 pounds in each hand wouldn't be worthwhile um, it just is not going to have the same impact on you being able to it's it's just not as important 
since the sport itself is bench squat and deadlift with a barbell. It's like the most related to that movement. And you could do all your assistance exercise. You could close grip bench press, you know, so someone's like, oh, well, you know, we need the dumbbells for the tricep extensions or we need uh, cables for tricep extensions. It's like, just do close grip bench press. It's going to, again, it's more, it's more in line with the exact thing. And again, I'm just kind of comparing some of this to running. Running is even dumber than lifting because <laughs> running is so, is, is so simple. You're literally just running straight. Like you're not really, there's not, you're not called upon to do much other than just to run straight. True, true. It does feel different when you haven't done it in a long time, though. Yeah. You know, it feels like a challenge when you, like, everything you've been it's doing so up to this It's so simple, point, it's impossible. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? But I do understand what you're saying, because sometimes, um, sometimes people can overcomplicate just, like, going low and slow. Because you sent me that video of mm -hmm. uh, Eliud Kipchoge, the way he warms up, and I know <laughs> he's the greatest. So, like, maybe his warm-up doesn't need to be as wild as anybody else's, but he just starts by going really slow and then he just slowly <laughs> picks it up until he's where he needs to be as far as his comfortable pace. And if you just want to start, right, it kind of reminds me of what Matt Choi mentioned, how he started running. He was like, I just ran a mile every day and did Murph. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> that was nuts, That's right? Too That's insane. And I do get he came from the background of football, but at the end of the day, it's he hasn't he wasn't running for a while. So he was really good at running right away too. He was like <laughs> he's running super fast. Uh, kind of reminded me of uh, Kalipa. His coach was like uh, Chris uh, Henshaw. Uh huh. It was like, well, he's like, when you do run, like, what time? <laughs> right? You know, what do you get when you run? Like you. And Jason's like, I don't know. He's like, I. He's like, well, you've done like a 400. Jason's like, I'm not sure what that is. He's like, it's a lap around the track of 400. 400 like, mm -hmm. And Jason's like, oh, yeah, I've done those before. He's like, well, what do you get when you do those? He's like, I don't know. I just run as fast as I can. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, maybe next time you go, can you time it? And then Jason's like, yeah, I think I did like 48 seconds. Or oh, something. <laughs> something just like. Wait, something crazy. Yeah. Something ridiculous. Maybe it was 50 seconds or something. It's just like, yo, what? But I just, I love his what? answer. It's like, how fast did you do it? In? And he's like, I just tried my hardest. Like, <laughs> oh, how fast right. did you do it? Fast. Yeah. <laughs> as fastest. fast as I possibly could. That's flying too. <laughs> you know, to get under a minute on that movement is some proficiency for sure. With yeah. running. Yeah. Pretty when amazing. can someone start implementing the power sandal? with all of this john did fucking 10 miles in those john's a beast when he said that i was like wait oh because i've only done like three and a half or mm -hmm. three to three and a half miles our boy john who trains here in the gym ran 10 miles in those Damn, what <laughs> yeah yeah i don't i wonder what his running background is because i've never really i've never got an idea but he must have done some running before i had an opportunity to run with him on saturday or, nice. fr or friday saturday no, Sunday. I had an opportunity to run him on Sunday. <laughs> I don't know what day it is either. Yeah. How was that? <laughs> great. Yeah, it was great. Um, the sandals are, are, are awesome to run in. Um, I haven't run in the sandals in a while. It's just been cold out here. So Super cool. it's been a while. But uh, the first time I started to run in them, I was in Hawaii. And I brought them with me specifically to Hawaii because I was like, you know what? I'm not, not even going to give myself an option to run in anything else. So I'm just going to bring these. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I just thought it was dumb. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm like, oh, they're super, wait a second. I'm like, they're super comfortable for walking. So maybe you can run in them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you did think they were dumb. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, I was like, these are dumb. And then Josh told me about them. I'm like, Josh, these are dumb. <laughs> Seema told me about them. I thought they were dumb. <laughs> and then I had my own experience with them and I took them for a spin. I had to adjust them a little bit. I had to tighten them up a little bit. Yeah. Cause I, I did jog with them and I got like a rock stuck underneath my foot for a moment or whatever. So I had to pull over and, you know, <laughs> to make a little pit stop there and make some adjustments, made some adjustments and it felt amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, let me see how tomorrow goes. And when I was in Hawaii, I was running really far. Um, my wife was there with some of her swimming friends and one of their friends, uh, she is a really high level uh, triathlete and uh, she's a Brazilian woman and she's like, you're going to run with me. And I was oh, like, oh, fucked. I was like, they told me about you, but they didn't tell me that you were like shredded. And like, <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know I was in for it like this, you know? <laughs> 
It's like, how far are we going to go? You know, I'm like almost crying before we even start. Yeah. But yeah, we ran like five, six miles. There was a lot of hills and stuff and the sandal, the sandal felt amazing. I think, I think in the end, I think you want your feet to be able to move around like feet. You want your toes to be able to spread. You want your foot to get stronger. You want to strengthen your foot. One of the best ways you can strengthen your foot is to have as much time as possible either with your shoes completely off or in something like a sandal or in something that's going to allow your foot to be in its normal shape. And it's really rare, no matter what kind of shoe you have, um, to, to, to have your foot really splay and act the way it needs to act. And so a sandal, I think, I think a sandal is a, is a really, is a really awesome uh, option. I want some Matt Choi feet. Mm, oh, yeah, I can't, those mm-hmm. tendons. I can't get those feet out of my mind, man. When he <laughs> flexed his toes and I saw just those tendons go pow, I was like, oh, yeah, you can be okay. Wild. I'm, I'm going to be okay. All I right. wish I had some before pictures because my feet were, I don't know, they looked like a loaf of bread or something. They were just not very, they're squishy. Tendonless. Yeah, tendonless. Yeah, we're all getting those thickies now. <laughs> <laughs> Working them. Working them feet. Yeah. yeah. For all the bigger size people that can't get the Parasounder right now because we sold out in some of the bigger sizes, we will get some soon and we will let you guys know when we are restocked. The sandal, in my opinion, might take a little while for it to get used to. Yeah. If you're not used to sandals or flip-flops or any of those things, we've talked about it many times on the show before, why why a flip-flop is not a great idea. And some people are like, you guys just own a flip-flop. This is a sandal that grabs the heel. It's going to stay on the foot. When you wear it and you see your feet moving in it, you're kind of amazed because you're like, this thing like stays on my foot really, really well. It's super comfortable. It doesn't seem like it would work. It doesn't seem like it would make any sense. Uh, but the cushion that we have on that particular shoe, you can go on you can go on trails. You can go areas where there's uh, like egg corns and weird bullshit on the ground, and you're not gonna you're not gonna smash your feet. You're not gonna beat up your feet. You got plenty of cushion underneath your foot. Uh, for your foot to be uh, healthy. We're actually making a special pair of these for our boy, Russell. Yeah? Yeah, we're actually making uh, making a custom custom fit for our buddy, Russell. because because his feet are wide? Yeah, we got to get this guy in, in a... I just, I really think it's going to make a huge difference when he has something that really fits him well. Mm-hmm. He, he His feet are big. He's a big guy. And, you know, I, I just think it's time to, to get him in something that's going to fit super comfortable, so... Yeah. I'm excited for that. Sick. That'll be fun. Did it take you guys any time to adjust to like the, th- you know, the strap going between your toes or any of that? Did any of that bug you or bother you? Did it rub on you weird or anything like that? <laughs> for for me, honestly, like I had one pair that I wore more than all the other ones. And that was because Josh from Shama, he adjusted them for me. And then so every other one, I was like, ah, oh, this one just doesn't fit right. And I knew it was just the adjustment. So I was just like being lazy about it. But then for the power sandal, I hadn't seen what helped me out with it. And once mm-hmm. he made sense of it, because I see a buckle and I'm like, I just don't know how these work. But then I watched this video here that I, oh, my camera just went out. Um, I watched this video right mm-hmm. here on our site. And I was like, oh, that's how you're supposed to do it. Takes a minute to mess with it and stuff. <laughs> it yeah. was shaking his Fucking head. I hate you both. <laughs> Fucking hate you both. Y'all don't understand. All right, you know what? Actually, let me clarify. You know when dogs have that little collar thing? The mm-hmm. choke collar? I still don't know how to adjust a dog collar to make it tighter on their neck. So in that mm. sense, I have my girlfriend, Sam. Mm. She adjusts the dog's collars. Now, when it comes to these, though. Chicks know how to work those buckles. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got a message from you. I got a message from you. You guys were like, these are uncomfortable. What's wrong? <laughs> I didn't say I I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> it's true. The cool thing is that, yeah, they can be adjusted well. And when they're adjusted well, they fit and they feel great. But like if the buckle is pushing on like inside of your toe towards like your, uh, the opposite side mm-hmm. of your foot, it can feel super fucking uncomfortable. Right. Cause like the toe, the buckles are, the strap is digging into your toe. So once it's adjusted, it feels great. The leather's broken out on mine. I've put in a lot of miles on it. So it feels even better. I dig them. Yeah, I think that's the advantage is that you can get them to fit really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's, you know, kind of Josh's uh, design. Yeah. Most comfortable footwear I have right now. Mm. Power Project Family, how's it going? Now, we talk about sleep all the time on the podcast because it's one of the biggest things that helps you with your health and fitness, your recovery, your muscle gain, your fat loss, everything. That's why we've partnered with Eight Sleep for such a long time now because the technology behind the mattress allows you to track your heart rate, the amount of times it takes you to fall asleep, your tosses and turns, your heart rate variability. It changes its temperature through the night based off how you sleep, but not only yourself, but maybe your partner on the other side of the bed. It is an amazing mattress. Andrew, how can they learn more? 
Yes, head over to 8sleep.com slash power project. That's 8 spelled out, E-I-G-H-T, sleep.com slash power project. Along with more information, you guys will actually save $150 off of your entire order automatically. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Quick question, man. Um, so I know you've been using the, those Nike Alpha Flies as like your your go-tos, especially on your longer runs. Um, do you remember the difference you felt between those and the Ultras? Because when I put your Alpha Flies on today, those Ultras, I ran in them mm -hmm. earlier this morning, and they they were springy, yeah, right? But those Alpha Flies were super springy. So do you know if there's a difference in width or anything like that? I'm going to find the name of the Ultras too. Yeah, Nike's weird. You know, they, they, ha they have a lot of, uh, you know, proprietary technology. Um, I think there is something to it. I think they have... Uh, a pretty damn springy shoe. So I don't really remember. I do remember that the ultras, um, they're called the ultra vanish by the way, uh, Andrew, I do remember that I liked them a lot, but the, one of the reasons why I, I discontinued wearing them is that, um, they didn't give me any extra comfort over the Nike. So, oh, okay. um, mm. because my foot, I don't know. I just got this like chubby foot and, it's hard for me to fit into certain things, but the Nike shoe, even though it's not the most amazing fit necessarily, the, the what my foot is in is mesh and it's able to stretch around around the foot. So I don't have any negative uh, impact with it. But yeah, you can see those are a little wider. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like- uh, maybe, I wish they made them even wider. Mm. Yeah, I was, you know, one thing you can do, and this is what I did with those, they were uncomfortable when I wore them the first time, but I took out the insole. Mm. I took the insole out and then I wore them again and they were super comfortable. Nice. Mm. So it's funny though, how like they choose the same colorway as Nike's super shoes. They do oh. the orange and they do the green, mm. just like Nike mm. has their orange and their green alpha flies. But yeah, those are those are pretty comfy too, but they don't give me as much boost like when I put on your Nikes. That mm. shit was insane. I felt like even if you're jumping, they're going to help you pop off the ground. It's it's really wild. I think a lot of it, again, has to do with uh, not just the carbon footplate, but there's something going on with the squishiness of the shoe. Yeah. And if you see someone standing in those shoes, you're kind of like, you you are worried about them because you, like, you're, you're thinking they're going to roll an ankle or something. Mm -hmm. Like that looks weird when someone's yeah. wearing those, and and you are kind of high up too. So uh, when you're running, uh, do do not pay attention to your phone. Pay attention to where you're running, because you will <laughs> you will roll your ankle, and you're gonna be like, <gasps> I've been very fortunate to where I've done that a bunch of times, but it hasn't. Uh, I've been lucky; it hasn't done anything to me, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. It scares the shit out of you because you're like, I'm pretty sure the whole side of my foot just hit the fucking oh, pavement. Yeah. So even though the ultras are wider, they weren't more comfortable than the more narrow Nike ones? For some reason, you know, ultra has three different like footprints and they decided to make this one in like their ah, slim fit. It's, I don't it's know right why. There. Okay. I don't know why they chose that. It must, it's probably just because a lot of the runners that they have, mm -hmm. you know, probably don't need that because they're maybe uh they're not big people a lot of times you know a lot of times runners are are, are lighter weight people that maybe don't need the wider okay makes sense. the wider foot yeah. there is a couple things i haven't really talked about running wise that would probably be good to add in here um i think hydration is really critical so i'm always bringing a lot of liquid with me um it appears that for this uh marathon that i'm going to need like at least a gallon of liquid with me uh, during the run, which is kind of uncommon. I think most, you know, someone like Matt, he, <clears throat> Matt Choi, he's just going to like run and then he's going to be thirsty and he's going to maybe stop or slow down a little bit and, and get some liquid at those uh, stations and, and maybe he'll have a bottle in his hand. Mm -hmm. That's maybe like a disposable thing that he'll like chuck or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, he and I did talk about that and I, I did, I did ask him, I, I was like, I think if you can mitigate that, I, I would be interested to know uh, how you feel on your runs because I think you might be able to even run faster than what you're able to run. I just think dehydration is a real, can be really limiting and uh, drinking like before your run and then just getting some liquid at some stations. I just, I don't think that's enough personally, but mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe you can, you can kind of train for anything, right? You can train yourself to be deprived of sleep. You can train yourself to be deprived of liquid and, and maybe you can like somehow fight through it in some way but 
it's just the math in my head, you know, works out that, uh, you know, if you start to lose more than like 2% of your body weight, um, you're just, you're not going to be as strong. And maybe that is a factor of just, uh, really flying on a marathon. Maybe that it's just the way it is. Uh, you play really high level tennis and you know, you're, you're in a tournament, you're going to be dehydrated, even though you're drinking in between, you can't really fuel up fast enough mm -hmm. to deal with the liquid that's, uh, that's going out. So, but for me, um, I got one of those little jet pack things and I'm drinking, uh, <laughs> drinking the water as I'm, is as a specific going. brand. Like, so like people, know uh, what you're talking about? yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what this one is, but there's like a camel, a camel pack that mm -hmm. people use. Um, I don't know what the name of this particular brand is, but it, whatever it is, it's not very good. Cause like it gets stuck mm -hmm. and I like had more liquid in there and I was uh -huh. like, damn it. I couldn't get, <laughs> I couldn't get it all, uh, all out of there. But, um, the liquid that I'm using is I'm using uh, carbs and amino acids. I'm using some of Nick Bear's product from BPN. I think just find something that you feel absorbs well with you. That's not going to make you shit your pants. <laughs> and uh, I think I think you'll end up having uh, some good results. But I think let's see today. So today I ran for an hour, mm. and I just ran back to my car and had the liquid in my car. Um, after I ran for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, and I probably had about a hundred carbs and two scoops of aminos. So, you know, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to implement that as I'm running. And I think for the marathon, I'll probably consume probably, you know, around 200 grams of carbohydrates during the run, maybe even wow. more. Cause I might have some uh, there's like candy and all kinds of shit you can bring with you, jelly beans and <laughs> <laughs> these little gel packets and uh, all kinds of stuff. It's just really just trying to stay hydrated and try to stay fueled up for the run. Have you tried getting like in ahead of it, you know, like taking a, I don't know, a lot of water the night before or right before. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, how does that, how has that gone? Yeah, you can do a little bit of that, but you know, you just, you might have to stop a lot and use the bathroom or something, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, I have, uh, I've just consumed more calories sometimes. I've tried to do it in some, a bunch of different ways, uh, with carbohydrates, with fats. Um, a keto brick actually works really good. A keto brick, like the night before a keto mm -hmm. brick is a product you can look up online, has a thousand calories in it. <laughs> I think like 99 grams of fat, like 30 grams of protein or oh, some, yeah. something wild like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that's a particular type of fat that could be kind of faster acting than a regular fat. I also have uh, in my carbohydrate mix, there's some MCT oil powder in there um, uh, from Bubs. And so I think uh, that could potentially be a slight advantage because again, it's supposed to be a fat that digests uh, fairly quickly. So I don't know. I think it's up to each individual to kind of like mess around with some of that and play with some of that. But I do think it helps a lot with my recovery. Like I get done with these workouts and uh, I feel good. I'm able to usually lift afterwards. And sometimes when I lift, I'll just make another shake um, because I'm just burning up more glucose. And so I'm like, well, let me, you know, let me sludge down some more of this. What you mentioned right there, Andrew, that was a really big thing that people should keep in mind, you know, uh, especially if you have a run the next day. Like, you do always want to make sure you're hydrated each day, uh, but the hydration the day prior can have an effect on your performance the next day. If, like, you didn't drink much water mm -hmm. on a Wednesday and then you have a hard workout or a hard run or a hard jujitsu session on Thursday, you're going to feel it even if you try to chuck a bunch of water and electrolytes on Thursday. So what you mentioned there in terms of just trying to make sure you're hydrated each day, it's going to play an effect just like making sure you have enough food the day prior. It's going to play an effect on your performance the next day too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, something to keep in mind. Yeah, that came to mind because I I, I remember one of the days I woke up to go to jujitsu and I'm like, man, I'm pretty thirsty. And I'm like, I'm already too late. Like, because if, if I woke up thirsty, that means yesterday I was way behind schedule and I'm not, you know, the 10 minute drive from my house mm -hmm. to Waza is like not enough time for me to actually rehydrate. At least I think, right? Like how much time do you need in order to replenish? Yeah, I think, uh, I think doing stuff, uh, staying way ahead of it, I think is important. So, yeah. um, I think you should try to be days ahead of it if possible, but I'm running every day. So, uh, uh, there's only so much ahead of it you can be, I guess. 
Um, but I consume like magnesium and zinc and I'll probably show you guys, like I have a whole fucking box of supplements and uh, just different powders and all kinds of different stuff that Dan Garner has, he Ooh. just told me to get all this different stuff. And I was like, okay, I'll get it all. And just, I keep mixing up these fucking potions all day long. And <laughs> uh, I'm just doing, doing what I'm told to do, you know, doing, doing what he's uh, recommending and suggesting. I don't know how big of a difference each thing is making. Uh, we'll find out, I guess in another couple of days, uh, I got my blood work done recently. Mm -hmm. He's supposed to give me kind of a report back on the blood work and supposed to be able to see, um, you know, what, what all that's looking like. Will you guys be talking about this at all in like, uh, the program that you two are making? Will you yeah. be mentioning the supplements? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We'll just, we'll talk about everything, but I think, I mean, the basics of it are to make sure you have your electrolytes in line. Um, taurine is huge. Um, he mm. can go into depth on that, on why he thinks that's important, but, um, that has helped me a lot. I'm somebody that used to get cramps a lot. I haven't had any cramps. I haven't had a cramp. I haven't had uh, even, I haven't even had the slightest, I haven't even, I'm just to make sure it's accurate. I haven't even had the slightest soft tissue injury uh, the entire mm -hmm. time we've been training together so far. This is amazing. Do you think it's because of the touring or all the things that have added up in terms of your habits that you've been doing, like the myofascial release? Yeah, I think it's a big combination of things. Okay. I think it's, you know, I, I started dedicating myself to getting more sleep. Uh, just over the last couple of weeks. And um, that has been interesting. I've been trying to get eight and a half, nine hours of sleep each night. Um, I think another thing is uh, just communicating with him a lot. So after every workout, I, I tell him how I felt, tell him like what I went through and how it was. I, I'll even just tell him if I'm annoyed. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, this is like... Uh, this workout was kind of annoying. Like, I don't know why it was fucking annoying. Uh, you, I don't know if you guys had had annoying workouts, but I was like, I just didn't, I didn't like it, you know? And so he'll work with that too. Cause he's mm -hmm. like, he wants to give me what I need, but he also wants to maneuver in what I want a little bit too, because that's a big factor. Like if I'm doing what I don't want to do every time, mm -hmm. he gave me a workout that had like bear crawls and had a bunch of stuff in there. And I was just like, I just told him, I'm like, I'm not going to do that workout. Like, I just won't. <laughs> and he was like, Roger, I get it. You know? And, and it's not because I don't believe in him. And it's not because I don't believe in what he's suggesting. It's just too different for me to mess around with at the moment. I'm like, I, that'd be really foolish for me to jump into that. I don't feel like it's going to work for me. So why even get involved in it? Like, just tell him flat out, like you don't believe in it. Tell him now so that he can adjust, you know? And so uh, we've had to make some uh, <laughs> little adjustments here and there. And he also knows that whatever he writes down, that I'm going to uh, go harder than whatever it is that he puts down. So he's hmm. aware of that. So he also is like, I think he's trying to like manage that. So if he knows if he puts like, hey, do a 12 minute mile pace, I'm going to do 11. Like everything I see from him, I'm like, fuck him. I'm going to fucking kill this workout. I take this workout and shove it right up his ass. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it works out for me. And sometimes like, sometimes the workout gets the best of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't man. wait till we have him here. He's going to be here uh, in a handful oh, of days, the beginning of next month. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, and you know, people are like, what about performance enhancing drugs? I'm still on them. I still love them. What? <laughs> They're still uh, part of the routine. Uh, not much has changed with those, but I'm not going to sit here and try to explain to you exactly what it is I take uh, because it gets banned and stuff by YouTube and all kinds of other weird, stupid stuff happens. So we'll just leave it. We'll just leave it at that. Andrew, want to take a sign out here, buddy? Yeah. What a way to leave them hanging. <laughs> but uh, thank you everybody for checking out today's episode. Please uh, drop us your comments down below. Maybe some more questions that we could hit on a uh, you know future episode when it comes to running super shoes and all that. They good shadow stuff. banned us before, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Big yeah. time. You can only talk to Tony Huge so many times before YouTube is like, Hey, you guys need to quit fucking around. So we can't be. Yeah. Anyways. Um, Make sure you guys uh, like today's video and then uh, hit subscribe if you guys are not subscribed and powerproject.life for everything podcast related, socials, all that other good stuff. And uh, my Instagram is at I am Andrew Z and the, follow the podcast at MB Power Project all over the place. And Seema, where are you at? Discord's down below and Seema Ending on Instagram and YouTube and Seema Ying on TikTok and Twitter. Mark.
I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.